Alright guys, how's it going? Today is a day when AMD undisputably retake the desktop performance crown with the 32 core Threadripper 3970X and 24 core Threadripper 3960X. AMD does have a 32 core part currently, of course, the 2990WX. However, that's a CPU which has its ups and downs due to the Quad Chip 2000 series setup. The chips launching today also have four chiplets, but now also this huge I.O. die, which should help to fix the worst of the 2990WX's problems. This isn't really a review as such. If you want that, then head over to the AdoreTV.com website and check out Kirk's review. Now, I've gone over these specs before, but for the sake of completion, as mentioned, the two chips launching today, the 3960X and the 3970X, they have 24 cores and 48 threads, and 32 cores and 64 threads respectively. The 3960X has a base clock of 3.8 GHz and a boost of 4.5, while the 3970 has a base clock of 3.7 GHz and also a boost of 4.5. Cache is 140 MB on the smaller part and 144 MB on the larger part. And the prices are $1,399 and $1,999 respectively. And this is now the completion of AMD's 2019 product stack. And note also that AMD has decided to sell second generation Threadripper as well under value high-end desktop. These prices here have just been taken off of Amazon and we can expect to see some official price changes soon. Now over the page and AMD are again getting the most out of Cinebench R20. But the point of this slide is really to show that in some loads at least, they're non-Threadripper chips are even ahead of Intel's current high-end Skylake X series. And of course, the real point of comparing these is it also helps to justify the pricing on these. Interestingly, they are also estimating Intel's 10,000 series Cascade Lake X performance. And rather unsurprisingly, I guess, the dynamic doesn't appear to have shifted a whole lot. This is really about the core versus core matchup. And with Intel's high-end desktop maxing out at 18 cores only, AMD decided to throw in a couple of Xeons into the mix. Intel's workstation class W3265 and W3275s. It's safe to say that, again, in Cinebench R20 at least, the Xeons get thrashed. These are actually 205 watt parts, but they lose heavily due to being limited with much lower clock speeds than the Threadripper chips. But most notably again is the vast difference in pricing, making the Intel parts absolutely worthless. It's not just Cinebench where Zen 2 excels of course, it's extremely fast in all of the ray tracers, with the 32 core 3970X being twice as fast as Intel's top end 9990XE more often than not. Now as I noted at the start of the video, the old 2990WX had somewhat inconsistent performance and also lagged behind Skylake X in single threaded performance. In this graphics benchmark suite, SpecView Perf 13, which is very single threaded, we see the new Threadripper CPUs are ahead in almost every case. AMD's press deck also included a couple of demos, which obviously is nice for us guys on YouTube because we get to show you them in our videos. First up was Isotropic's Clarice, which is a kind of CPU 3D renderer. And as you see, the 3970X came in quite a bit faster compared to Intel's flagship. Not quite fast enough to suggest that all 32 cores and 64 threads are being hammered though, I would wager. Looking at this difference here, at least, the second demo was of Boris FX's Mocha Pro. This is a really cool piece of software, which allows you to remove parts of a video, like for example, this car here. The renderer then fills in the blanks behind where the car was, and we can see this working in real time, and this time the 24 core 3960X is very clearly faster. In fact, it's twice as fast as the 9980XE. That's quite a result there. Now, getting back to some slides and looking at Spec Workstation 3 performance, it's pretty much the same story. Threadripper wins by a little bit in the single threaded stuff and the GPU bound benchmarks and it wins by a lot, an awful lot, when those cores and especially that floating point unit is being pounded. I like this slide for the humour, saving developers from too much free time. Essentially, with speedups like this, there's going to be less time sitting around waiting on your jobs finishing, giving you the opportunity to do more work in the same time. This is our real thrashing going on here. This one is also quite nice from a personal perspective. 
as it shows that from start to finish of video production, there is a lot of time to be saved at every step of the way. Now, regarding power efficiency, AMD do have a lot more cores and a lot more performance. So rather than showing total wall power, where they are a little bit behind thanks to the huge 280 watts of the new chips, when you factor in the extra performance, they are commandingly ahead in performance per watt. And again, please note Cinebench R20, the new darling of AMD's benchmark suite. In that, they are claiming less than half the power per core compared to Intel's ancient 14 nanometer 9980 XE. There's a lot of power in the Infinity Fabric too, of course, though. And staying on that topic, this layout of having the four chiplets around the I.O. die, that allowed AMD to reduce the IFOP power. 27% reduced IFOP power, allowing them to allocate more clock speed to the core chiplets. And the new topology also ensures equal PCIe and DRAM access to all of the four dies. Now, it's confirmed that Threadripper 3000 will require a new socket. When I asked, was there any chance that the mobile guys might find a way to make X299 and X399 boards compatible? The answer was a firm no. The pin counts are the same, however, they are not pin compatible. I'll talk more about why that is later. Due to the new socket, AMD also took the opportunity to increase PCIe lane count. And this slide shows the difference between their new chips and their competitor processor. The accusation here apparently being that with certain workloads on that competing processor, the lack of bandwidth between the CPU and the PCH could end up being something of a drawback. The competitor maybe has more lanes, but they are Gen 3, and the AMD part looks like it will be much less likely to get bottlenecked by something like that. But I know some of you aren't happy about this, but that's how it is. New TRX40 chipset, new STRX4 socket. There's going to be around 10 motherboards, I believe, with the big guys here maybe having a couple each. Kirk has two for his review, and he got the chance to have a look at both. During the call, AMD's Robert Halleck was keen to point out that Threadripper does have ECC memory support on some motherboards, while Intel doesn't. The new Threadrippers can support 256 gigabyte maximum of DDR4 in an 8x32 gigabyte configuration. DDR4-3200 is the official rating. However, DDR4-3600 didn't appear to cause too many issues in their own testing. But as you know, with overclocking, your mileage can vary. Threadripper 3rd Gen has already been used for movie and trailer video effects. That was by Blur Studios in Terminator Dark Fate. And if the reason why isn't obvious by now, I guess this final benchmark slide may make it so. It doesn't really matter what kind of workstation or high-end desktop load that you're producing. The new Threadripper chips are easily first and second fastest. And that is a third generation Ryzen Threadripper 3960X and 3970X. High-end desktop, but this time without compromises. Before I get to the analysis, let's have a quick look through the reviewer's guide. I like this product fact sheet, mostly for the transistor counts of around 3.9 billion per CCD. Multiply that by four, of course, for the four chiplets. 8.34 billion transistors in the IOD. That is a lot of transistors. Officially 74 square millimeters per CCD and a mammoth 416 square millimeters for the IOD. And the former, as we know, those were fabbed at TSMC and the IOD was fabbed at Global Foundries. All this together is 24 billion transistors. And when you look at it that way, suddenly the prices don't look quite so bad. Next was the official memory configuration support. And I guess 4x16 dual rank DDR4-3200, that should be a pretty popular configuration. And the rest of the reviewer's guide essentially went over the same benchmarks that you just saw. However, gaming results were also included. It's unlikely that you're going to buy one of these to game. However, guys like me could theoretically do that, as I game a fair bit and also produce content. And in fact, I used a 1950X for about a year. Looking at AMD's own numbers, which they ran at 1440p with an RTX 2080, and it was something of a disappointment for me as the new chips came in 1% behind Intel's Skylake X CPUs. On closer inspection though, and it appeared to be down to one very bad result in Call of Duty Black Ops 3, where for some reason the new Threadrippers perform a lot worse than even the older 2000 series chips. And throughout these benchmarks, 
we really can see that the older Threadrippers really do show inconsistent performance and in most cases the new chips have fixed that. And indeed they beat Skylake X more often than not. However, this outlying result here in Call of Duty does not help them in this overall average. I asked Robert why would he include that benchmark? And he answered with Black Ops 3 is a very highly benchmarked title and they included it for the sake of transparency. There was no disagreement when I noted that their competitors probably wouldn't have brought their own issues, however small, to the attention of the press. I guess this one all comes down to how you see this stuff in general. Would you have chosen to show a 2015 game where the performance just seems to flop for some reason? I told them that I wouldn't have, but that I can understand both perspectives. I'd be interested in knowing what you would choose to do. Do you go for the transparent option or do you hide it? Especially as it really does appear to be just this one game and apparently Far Cry 5 as well, which isn't in this. So that's two games where for some reason it just doesn't quite seem to suit the Ryzen architecture or perhaps a chiplet layout. Now the last thing to know about the reviewer's guide was there were no shenanigans being pulled regarding coolers or different setups etc. They've all got the same coolers, they're all using the same memory, the same storage, the same GPU, everything the same that could be the same. The simple fact here is AMD knows that they are miles ahead and quite simply they've got no need to attempt to hobble the competition who do a good enough job of hobbling themselves. And staying on that point, Intel are today of course launching their own new Cascade Lake series of chips as well. Both the Intel and AMD series were set to launch at 3pm Central European time. However, Intel decided very late to pull their embargo time forward by six hours. One quote I heard from a member of the press was, Intel didn't want their products shown alongside the new Threadrippers. Given what you've just seen, that's not really surprising, as Cascade Lake X will lose heavily. However, messing the tech press around like this is surely not the best way forward for Intel. All of these guys who got both parts, they've already written their reviews. They've made up all their benchmark slides and they've formed conclusions based on how both sets of products perform. For Intel to tell them on Friday that the already dumb Monday launch is being brought forward by six hours is just ludicrous. So many of these press guys would have to work over the weekend, fixing their charts and updating their conclusions. And from what I heard, AMD considered pulling their embargo forward six hours too. However, that would just end up messing with guys like me on YouTube. I literally took a call on this on Friday evening and have worked on this video over the weekend. I really need that six hours on the Monday as well. Kirk for the website just got his package delivered on Friday also, so time is pretty critical here. As it was, AMD decided not to change their embargo time. And it'll be interesting to see what the press says about being messed around by Intel like this and also how they deal with it. You might think the smart thing to do here would be just ignore Intel's new time and go ahead, launch both reviews at 3pm. However, there will be outlets who go ahead with the new time and they are the ones that will get the rewards for being first out with reviews. I'll let you figure out how hard I'd slam any of them for pulling stunts like this. In fact, I remember slamming AMD over the Vega launch which came only three days after Threadripper 1950X. This stuff is just messing us around. Now to finish this one off and as you saw that was AMD's 2019 product stack. However, it is not the last Threadripper 3000 series chips that we will see. I did note that with the 3960X and the 3970X, AMD had left enough room for naming a 48 core 3980X and perhaps a 64 core 3990X. Perhaps the new socket was also a clue there. And AMD have now finally announced that they are going beyond 32 cores. The one CPU to rule them all in 2020 will be the 64 core 3990X. And apparently the new pins were required for powering this monster. They just couldn't do it on X399. The high-end desktop market is only 1.5 billion dollars but it really ought to be completely owned by AMD by this time next year. Intel are in real trouble in this space. Their core counts 18 cores versus 64, it is just not there and their 10 nanometers is a joke. And the simple fact that AMD did decide to go ahead with this part may also bode very well for Zen 3. A few days ago their data center executive Forrest Norod in an interview with The Street 
When asked about what kind of performance gain Milan's CPU core microarchitecture, Zen 3, will deliver relative to Zen 2. In terms of IPC, he said that, unlike Zen 2, which was more of an evolution of the Zen microarchitecture that powers the first generation Epic CPUs, Zen 3 will be based on a completely new architecture, before asserting that Zen 3 will deliver performance gains right in line with what you would expect from an entirely new architecture. And he continued with, at a time when Intel is promising double-digit IPC gains for future microarchitectures, AMD is confident in being able to drive significant IPC gains each generation. And to be blunt, Forrest isn't guessing here because we already know that Milan is sampling. He isn't talking up entirely new architecture IPC gains and then not going to deliver on that. There is no end to the pain until this is a completely different AMD. Even going back to the early Opteron days in the early 2000s, on the CPU side of things at least, they have turned into a relentless execution machine. What a difference from the bulldozer days. Right, to finish off, go check out Kirk's review on the website by clicking on the button, especially if you want a different perspective to what you'll see elsewhere, as Kirk is our enterprise and now also our high-end desktop reviewer. I hope you enjoyed that one. I hope you enjoyed this one. And I'll catch you later, guys.